This is a holy and terrible place, the house of God and the gate of heaven. And the Catholic Church is where I grew up in, that was written over it. It's from an older saying of scripture. But in a larger sense, I think we need to look at the earth and look at the earth and say, this is a holy and terrible place. Terrible in the word of awesome, the house of God and the gate of heaven. One of the problems of being an environmental activist is after a while you begin to come to the conclusion that we humans do not deserve this planet. Um, it's hard. There are many bad things we do to this planet. Um, and I teach a course on why we do these things. Um, we're ecologically programmed actually to do the bad things we do to this planet. We're also ecologically programmed to do the good things we do to try and save the planet. For our great strength as a species is that we can work together. And that intelligence evolved not to make us clever, not to make us memory, intelligence evolved so that we could work together in, in groups of society to band together to do things. And there's a lot of banding together going along around, around these issues and it's very important that this continue. Because frankly, um, we are um, facing, a, we are facing a, the threat of global suicide. I mean, sometimes we talk about global warming as if it was kind of a policy problem. You know, um, well, we gotta look at global warming, here's renewable energy, we can do this better, we can do it worse. The truth of the matter is, what we're doing to the planet's atmosphere has not been done in at least 55 million years. What we're doing to the oceans, acidifying them, has not been done in 300 million years. What we're doing to the weather has often been done in terms of the history of the planet, but it has never been done in terms of the history of the planet when it had this particular mix of species on it. Um, we tend to forget the extent to which we evolved in the current climate and the current band of conditions, and that we evolved to have these things uh, happen gradually. Um, I have friends in Florida uh, they tell me now that there are intersections in Miami that high tide always floods. Um, for, uh, most of us know the stories of the Dust Bowl. The next great ecological migration in the United States, the next great fleeing from ecological disaster is going to take place in southern Florida, whose average height is four feet above current sea level, and you know, which is pursed on limestone karst, which uh, sucks in seawater. Um, mixes it with the groundwater. Um, we're doing awful, we're doing some really hard things to this planet. And the hardest fact about what we're doing to the planet, of course, is we're doing them out of good intentions. I mean, the fossil fuel that has now become the planet's enemy made this world. It made this wonderful construction, it made these lights, it made these cameras, it made this microphone, it made the clothes we wear, it made the shoes we're on. It made the cars we drove to get here, it made this. It's very hard, the hardest thing in human life to do is turn your back on success. Fossil fuel has made us an enormous success and it made us a success in seven generations. Because um, the modern world began in 1765 when James Watt invented the reciprocating steam engine and we needed all this coal and oil and natural gas that nature provided us to drive them. That's seven generations in my family, eight if you factor in my daughter's new, grand, my daughter's new daughter. Um, so what are we gonna do about that? Well, we're gonna have to do what humans have always done when faced with a successful disaster. At the end of the ice age, we were such good hunters that 2000 years later, we'd wiped most of the big game off the face of the earth, so we had to invent farming. After 5,000 years of farming, we were so good at it, we spiked our population, we had to invent cities. And then we had to invent cities that traded. Then we had to invent um, uh, te commercial technology, we had to invent industry. We've managed to dodge the bullet a fair number of times, but are we gonna dodge the bullet again? What it comes down is something very simple. What it comes down to, and this has got to be seen not as a policy reality, not as kind of a choice, but as an existential reality, that we have to get rid of, we have to turn our back on fossil fuel. I mean, I read the things, <laughs> unfortunately easier said than done, but it has to be said first. 
because everybody is afraid to say this. If you look at um, the speech, you know, the speeches of our president, and our administration, they say, well, we'll have an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050. Ignoring how safely far in the future that is, although I tell my students, you will be alive in 2050, so I hope you're thinking about it. Um, the truth of the matter is 20% fossil fuel multiplied through the growing world economy is gonna be just about as bad as we've got today. Moreover, the truth of the matter is we have a $600 billion a year fossil fuel industry. If we leave the industry in place, we do not come up with ways of transitioning out of it. That industry has got tons and tons of carbon. There's gobs of it in the earth. We may have extracted 2% of the carbon we buried 300 million years ago. Um, as long as there's money to be made from fossil fuel, people are gonna dig it out. Um, the, we have to face the fact that we have to go out of fossil fuel. Now we have two great ways to do this and two, inter, the two great ways to do this are wind power and solar power. I'm not here to speak for any wind project or any solar project tonight. Um, those, those are complicated issues. Those of us who are environmentalists have to bring to the design of our wind power and our solar systems the same critical intelligence, the same knowledge, the same creativity we're bringing to fighting issues like fracking. You know, we can't just make, wave a magic wand and slap up a few solar reflectors. We can't decide, oh, here's a good place for wind. It looks like the numbers make sense. We have to think in systems terms. We have to think in serious terms of serious systems. If we think in terms of serious systems, we are going to actually find an enormous amount of benefit. Now, I'm not gonna cite any of the studies that exist about green energy or the economic benefits of it. We know as a matter of historical fact that when you bet on the future, you bet on progress, you bet on prosperity. It's when you fight the future that you run into problems, you run into misallocation of resources, you run into the kinds of things we experienced with Sandy, you run into the kinds of things we we're experiencing with global weather patterns, you run into a kind of drought, you run into a kind of coastal, when we do not commit to the future, we are stuck in the past. And unfortunately, the cost of the past has now gotten to be too high for us. I mean, let's admit, what happened with fossil fuel is we ran, it was a good thing and we ran it into the ground. We didn't think about the pollution, we didn't think about the impacts on landscape, and now we've got to do that. What's very important for all of you as carriers of opinion, as people who are committed to thinking about the world you live in and your responsibility for it, is you have to make that existential understanding that fossil fuel has to go and we have to work at it. We're going to have to figure out ways of kind of dialing down the $600 billion a year in fossil fuel we are spending. The importance of proposals like the Long Island wind farm is not necessarily they're good ideas or bad ideas, but the point is we can take the money that is going into fossil fuel and we can put it elsewhere. That there are interesting and creative ways to spend that money and to meet our energy needs. I'm often told by people that I deal with in the corporate world, well, you know, renewables are great, but they can't really meet the need for the future. And this is a strange argument that is actually unfortunately picked off a few people, like the, great, um, like the great prophet of global warming, James Hansen, says some, somehow panicked over the issue of renewables and he's now arguing for nuclear power. Um, I would suggest he should consider, if he doesn't think renewables can be staffed up in time, I wonder what he thinks we're gonna do to build 1,200 new nuclear power plants. But be that as it may, it's very important for you to convey the kind of sense of public opinion. Quite apart from writing Governor Cuomo, as was suggested, quite apart from joining these organizations, it is the sense of understanding that you have, that you will convey in your daily life and in your daily actions, that you will pass on in the discussions you will have with people, that will be the most important thing you take from meetings like this. That is, the future depends, unfortunately, on you. Our leaders seem to be mostly stuck in a time warp. 
I mean, I don't blame Governor Cuomo. I mean, basically, it's hard if you're a political figure with all of these competing interests to turn your back on the future, on the past and say, we're gonna to commit to the future whatever it takes. It's very hard to play Franklin Roosevelt if you're not Franklin Roosevelt. It's very hard to play Teddy Roosevelt if you're not Teddy Roosevelt. Um, the, but we have to do that. Um, we have to understand that this is a very simple truth. The cost of fossil fuel has just become too high for us, for our children, for the people we share the planet with, and most of all, for the planet itself, upon <coughs> whose resources and whose vitality we depend for our own life. Um, John Kennedy once said that we have to essentially bring reason um, to arms before they destroy us. He was talking then about nuclear power, but it's the same point of view. We have to be a voice for the obvious. The obvious is global warming is coming at us with all the uh, destructive power of a freight train that's off the tracks. That's obvious. And we don't necessarily, you know, there are people who argue that maybe we won't have another Sandy again. Maybe we won't. But what we will have is an ocean in which jellyfish love it and shellfish hate it. What we will have is an ocean rise that is going to flood out huge sections of the eastern seaboard. What we will have are weather patterns, and if you want to go into the American Southwest uh, and look at what's going on, we will have weather patterns lead to forest fires, to drought. Um, I'm actually loving this winter because for the first time in a long time, we have a period of days below 32 degrees. So we're actually getting a little frost that will help freeze out the critters that have been migrating up here from point south. Um, unpleasant things like West Nile disease, for example. These are all things we have to stand for. These are all things that in the organizations, the work we do against fracking, we have to embody. But we have to re recognize that while fracking, as many, many things, fracking is just one of the latest embodiments of our inability to kind of put two to two together and come up with four. 50 years ago, we would have thought fracking was the greatest thing since sliced bread. We would have probably paid the price of the wrecked landscapes, the water, the polluted water, because we would have thought this, ener this energy is so valuable, but it's no longer the greatest thing since sliced bread. We have a, we have a, a democratic and supposedly progressive administration whose energy policy is everything all of the above, which means in short, it has no policy. Um, the, it has that because this is an industry that has tremendous power. This is an industry that has not only tremendous power, if you go back and read the books 20 or 30 years from ago, they also think the best thing we can do is have more oil, more gas. That the thinking that it's great that we're now exporting more oil than we are importing, that's old fashioned thinking, that's energy security thinking, but we were all there. Those of us who can remember back to OPEC and the debates about OPEC, we are carrying around all of this old thinking. It's very important that the public kind of cut through this old thinking with a knife and just look and say, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, if we're wrecking the landscape of New York, what's the, you know, what's the benefit to us? If we're building this LNG port offshore to send natural gas that our environmental damage has paid the price for, and is going to essentially fuel the people who compete with American workers. You know, what's wrong with this picture? The point is that fossil fuel and the, play, the ways it is now operating in the American economy puts forth far too many of these pictures. Um, for those of you who want to worry about next week's crisis, there are proposals from the Keystone people and the people in the Bakken Shale in North Dakota to rail through New York State, you know, I uh, forget the name of the exact name of it, these long, mile long trains of tanker cars to carry oil. The oil will go to the Port of Albany where it will be put in barges and come down the Hudson River. 
um, into our harbor and ultimately to the refineries in New Jersey. Um, shall we contemplate what will happen if we get one of those train wrecks they had up in Quebec? Even the conservatives in North Dakota are complaining about the train safety for this oil transportation. Um, it was mentioned that we used to store liquid natural gas in Long Island. Um, they had a sloppy cleaning procedure. It blew the whole place up, 40 people died. Um, you don't have to have a lot of these accidents to really make a mess of things. The, we're playing with very, very serious kinds of things. And it's the rationales behind this. This is good for the economy. This is gonna lower our natural gas prices. And sometimes these rationales make some sense. You know, the Bloomberg administration promoted natural gas because they thought it was doing something to help respiratory illness. Unfortunately, what they failed to pay attention to is the natural gas they're promoting probably has lots of radon in it. And that if we don't do something about the radon bill that Dick Gottfried and Linda Rosenthal have been pushing, um, we're all going to have radon with our coffee, which I don't find to be a particularly appealing prospect. Um, so, you've heard some tactical advice. Um, don't get too carried away. I mean, the important thing for the governor is to know how you feel about this. Um, you know, he's a very smart politician. I, tr I generally try not to advise how to think him politically. Um, the basic thing you want to do is make him sure he knows where you stand um, and to keep banding together. I got into this issue five years ago, weirdly, you know, because some people came to me and said, you know, you did some wonderful things up in the watershed. They're about to screw you um, with gas fracking in the watershed. We've already won one great victory against gas fracking in this city. We've kept it out of the New York City watershed. So we will continue to drink the best water in the world. Now we want to win another victory. We want to keep it out of our harbor. But the ultimate victory will, for us will be if we, create an, if we support the creation of an economy that gets us out of this freight train of environmental and economic wreckage while there is still time to do that. Every day counts, and the fact that you're here counts a lot more. Thank you.